it could be limiting production. It could be limiting some immune function, um, especially in the higher producing broilers. So um, in, in that particular space, we're just interested in investigating um, effects on growth, especially with woody breast and white striping and some dietary interventions that can have impact downstream because one of its other effects is vasodilation. So um, it also can be improving blood supply to maybe a region in the woody breast that has been marginalized for blood supply. All right, welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host today, Kelly Walmsley, and I'm joined by Dr. Liz Bobeck. Hey, Liz. Hi, I'm so happy to be here and chat with you today. Yeah, thanks for taking a break from your other duties, including poultry podcast host, and then coming on to join me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So Liz, you are an associate professor at Iowa State, um, and how long have you been there? Um, 2016, I started January 1st, so time keeps flying. So eight years, just over eight years. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, time it, for some reason it does keep going. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I kind of like to do a this or that kind of thing. And so Ooh. I'm going to do a little rapid fire with you. So you bear with me. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. Fried or grilled chicken. Grilled. <laughs> <laughs> broilers or layers? Uh, I, I like the broilers. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. A little partial. Mountain or beach? Ooh, mountain. Um, and then fried or scrambled egg? Uh, scrambled. Love me some scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And now what poultry nutritionist or poultry professional would you take with a zomb- in a zombie apocalypse and why? Oh, that is, okay. Well, um, my graduate school colleague, Vanessa Leone, I would take in a heartbeat because, uh, we got, we got called, um, sisters by our PI Mark Cook at the time. And we desperately wanted to go on, I can't forget, remember the name of the show, but it, it was the, um, you're, you get dropped here and you have to find your way to a destination. What was that show? Oh, I would love that. Yes. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the show, but early 2000s, I can't either, it was but like, I what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. You're, lo- you're lost and you have to, you get no money and you have to get. So we were, I mean, yes, Zombie Apocalypse, me and Vanessa would, we would I love be there. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Well, we can talk for a really long time about one of those survival shows like that. <laughs> Ready for more sustainable poultry production? New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. Let's just change gears, I guess, and talk about, um, we'll save that for another one or something, but um, (laughs) let's um, talk a little bit about one of the projects that you've been working on in your lab um, with um, feeding an arginine silicate uh, additive, and then it's with broilers, and then you've also done some layer research, but let's talk about broilers first. Um, And so first, let's just talk about arginine, right? It's um, maybe not an amino acid that people would formulate to as much and balance for in the diet, but it's, it's one of those that's pretty important with immune function. That's probably what's most recognized for. Um, but so, you know, why are you focusing in on arginine and what, what's your interest there? Yeah. So, um, we're, we're working with a company to do some of this work, but we were originally interested in it because it, Um, my, my group does a lot of immune work and we're of course interested in, uh, phenotype switching with immune cells and arginine use. Um, but overall, as we keep reducing down the amount of protein in the diet, it starts to become one of those marginally or potentially limiting amino acids. So, um, with more companies starting to actually supply those sorts of becoming marginal, uh, limiting amino acids, um, different companies are supplying 
products that have different bioavailabilities. So um, this particular product um, is kind of in a pre-development stage. It's inositol stabilized. So it seems to be having some positive effects. Maybe it's uh, available longer in the digestive tract and especially those broilers who are super digesters um, can, yeah. can pick it up along the digestive tract a little bit better than just, um, you know, another uh, complex amino acid. Um, but it's just, it's so interesting because it, it could be one of those amino acids where maybe we should pay a little more attention to it. It could be limiting production. It could be limiting some immune function, um, especially in the higher producing broilers. So um, in, in that particular space, we're just interested in investigating um, effects on growth, especially with woody breast and white striping and some dietary interventions that can have impact downstream because one of its other effects is vasodilation. So um, it also can be improving blood supply to maybe a region in the woody breast that has been marginalized for blood supply. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, and we're not talking about adding this great amount of arginine um, or the, the additive that you were looking at. How, what are the, what are the kind of incremental amounts that you're choosing? And then where, where did you go in with like, you know, are we at for optimal dose yet? Or um, where are we at in the stages of recommendations? Yeah, so we identified this compound out of a group of several that we were looking at for changes to positive changes to performance and positive changes to incidence of woody breast, especially the severe woody breast in broilers, you know, at day 49. Um, we started at uh, an amount in the diet as low as 0.025% and worked our way up to 0.15%. So, you know, within, within that amount, we had four different uh, equally spaced diets and it could be that maybe that 0.15, we even might need to go higher. Um, but we saw a lot of positive benefits in performance at the lowest dose at 0.025. Um, and that was so throughout we don't know. 42 did yes. grow out too? Okay. Uh, 49. Yeah. We, okay, we took 49. some parameters at 42 as well, just because it's a common end date. <laughs> but sure. yeah. We were looking to promote woody breast and we were, we were looking at broilers, uh, male broilers that were more likely to develop woody breast over time. Sure. And so, um, so what'd you find? So overall, we found that there might basically be a difference in uh, the amount that is needed for certain key end indicators. So um, overall, the lowest dose, the, the 0 0.025, was really instrumental in reducing the severity and the overall amount of woody breast by day 49. So um, where some of the other groups had, you know, 75% or more of the birds in the, the moderate and severe category, over half of the birds in the 0 0.025 were in normal. So, I mean, that's yeah. pretty phenomenal. Yeah, um, so it, it was, it was almost a 50% reduction in incidence overall. Um, but interestingly, that they also had uh, improved performance um, at day 42. We didn't see it at, at day 49. It just kind of um, plateaued, if you will. Yeah. Um, but for white striping, some of the, the higher doses actually improved white striping much better than the low, the 0 0.025. So if your outcome is just woody breast, maybe the lower, lower dose is better. But if you're looking into some of the other categories, white striping maybe, uh, you know, related to woody breast, that maybe a higher dose is better. But Probably the biggest issue with all of this is can the feed mill deliver it <laughs> at yeah. those low amounts? Yeah. Can it be put into a premix or something? So you might you might in the end pick a dose that works in the functional world and outside of research. Sure. Yeah. And so you're you're just looking at just this, these small. Um, uh, just supplementations, um, le varying levels, and you were adding it on top of an already balanced diet, right? Um, yeah. And, and so arginine was already, so what, what, I guess, what were your amino acid levels that you were feeding, um, from your goal for all of, uh, compared to breed your recommendations? So um, we just followed the, the published Ross 708, and I am fully aware that uh, a lot of groups will go above or beyond or below. And I know there are many amino sure. acids that won't, but you got to use a published source, right? When you're right, <laughs> when absolutely. You're working. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So our target, I, our target, I believe, was 1.39 for arginine, um, and we made space in the diet um, using non-nutritive components to make those other. Uh, the, the five diets total from control out to the highest amount. Sure. Um, 
but you know, overall, we're we're trying to be as relevant to to industry as possible, but also providing the simplest diet so we can test our ingredient and make sure it's not an interaction with some other component. So, yeah, the industry nutritionist will say, "Well, this is actually what we feed," but I, yes, I, I, I'm fully aware that you have optimized amino acid doses beyond our research, but we we are using some published values, which is kind of what we just have to work on because it's what we're uh, we're able to repeat over time. <laughs> sure. And you have to have some kind of starting point too, right? Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the, but I think this is really exciting um, data because, you know, you think about other breast uh, you know, muscle myopathies coming along, you know, potentially, I mean, we got spaghetti breasts. Do you think that this might also be a solution for some of those other ones that are coming down or ones that we don't even know about? Yeah, it's it's such an interesting thing because if you if you sit on the potential mechanism that's a vasodilator, yeah. um, it it could help some of those other issues that are related to the muscle structure or function. Um, in our cohort of birds, we did look for spaghetti meat. We didn't see any, um, yeah. but it just could be our you know our group of birds um, because I know they kind of it kind of comes in in waves sure. <laughs> in the industry. Yeah, I know I've only seen it like once or twice in our plant and we process a lot of birds and that's what I, I don't see spaghetti breasts as much. But of course, um, you know, woody breasts and white striping see a little bit less of it than previously, but still see it for sure. So it's interesting. Yeah. OK, well, what do you want to leave people with today? Um, there, the dietary intervention is not going to be the only <laughs> the only thing for these muscle myopathies, um, you know, from other, other people's work, especially Dr. Vellman's who we, um, you know, talk to and collaborate with when we think about how to set up our studies, it's multifactorial. It's everything from genetics, housing, time of year, and the nutrition plane the birds are on. So it's kind of this holistic approach really, but if you can have another tool in your toolbox, I think some of these really interesting nutritional interventions could be really key players as we move forward. Sure. Yeah, I, I like that. That's a good one to lean on. Um, so uh, with closing, I've got one last this or that. Um, Chuck Norris or Jackie Chan? Uh, Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Liz. Uh, with that, we'll conclude today. And thank you all for joining us in another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Thanks, Liz. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.